And uh, we are moving on to an online speaker. We have Morgan Levine uh, joining us. Morgan, can you hear us? I can hear you. Hi, Morgan. Um, whenever you're ready, please uh, share your screen. Okay. All right. So, yeah, thank you guys for letting me do this online. Sorry I couldn't be there. Although it's probably for the best because I have a really nasty cold with like 101 fever today. So bear with me on uh, this talk. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about epigenetic clocks and kind of go over where we are and where um, at least I think we need to go with them to continue to improve these types of measures. So the whole goal of measures like epigenetic clocks are to actually try and quantify aging in living systems, which is actually a fairly difficult task. So People don't actually have a good definition of what aging is or what we're actually trying to measure. Um, so the way I like to think about aging is that it's literally just a breakdown of a living system. So going from a very highly ordered, high, you know, well-designed complex system to kind of losing that complexity um, and losing a lot of that structure and function. Um, but the difficulty is that aging happens both at a hierarchical level. So you have changes happening at the atomic level, molecular level, and these, once they reach a certain level, will emerge. And actually, you'll see these at higher levels of biological organization. Uh, living systems are also dynamic. So as you start having changes at different levels, other features will actually respond to that and change as well. And it's also complex, so you have a lot of interactions as well. The other really difficult thing about actually trying to quantify aging is that aging is latent. So we don't actually, again, have a good definition or way to directly measure aging. So instead, we actually have to infer something via mathematical modeling. And I like to always emphasize that we are never going to actually be able to perfectly measure aging. So, you know, people can argue, oh, that's not a good measure of aging, and we'll never get there. And there's actually no way to perfectly measure this, but we can do um, different tests to actually kind of get at how good our models are. So if this is, you know, such a difficult task, why, why are we even doing this? Um, and there's kind of three reasons that I think it's important to try and quantify the aging process. Um, one is just to understand population health. I don't have to explain to people in this room that aging is the big, biggest risk factor for most of the diseases people suffer from and also for death. So we actually want to understand differential risk of disease. We actually should be able to quantify aging and be able to compare people at the same chronological age. Um, measuring aging will actually also just help with our basic science understanding of the aging process. We can use these models to infer something about causality and also modeling different systematic, uh, systemic uh, changes. And then probably the most um, obvious is for using these models in intervention testing. So if we are going to do interventions in long-lived species like humans, we need quicker biomarkers to actually be able to assess whether our interventions are effective. So uh, measures that quantify aging can be used as biomarkers as either primary or secondary outcomes in clinical trials. So I'm going to talk about epigenetic clocks. This is just one type of measure that people have developed to try and quantify the aging process. It is not the only type, and more and more um, methods are being developed every day. Um, but my lab is very interested in epigenetic clocks mainly because we like to think of the epigenome as the operating system of the cell. So basically all the cells in your body have essentially the same DNA, but it's the epigenome, which is this dynamic program, which gives rise to the diversity of all the cellular states in your body. Um, so epigenetic clocks are just based on one form of epigenetic modification, specifically DNA methylation. <clears throat> and this is when you get the addition of a methyl group, to a cytosine, uh, a CPG dinucleotide. So basically looking five prime to three prime, you have a cytosine followed by a guanine. When these sites become methylated, they can, uh, they can cause condensation of the chromatin structure and it's thought to be repressive. So when we measure DNA methylation in bulk, this is usually 
um, an estimate of the proportion of cells in your sample that have methylation at a given site. So in this example, this is one person, one CPG. If this magenta color is a methylated cytosine, a cell with a methylated cytosine at this specific CPG, you might say that there's 60% of the cells in the sample uh, have DNA methylation. Um, and this could be compared to another sample that might have 30% here. So what this data actually looks like is um, we tend to measure DNA methylation using arrays. And so we have hundreds of thousands of CPGs where for every individual and every CPG, we know essentially the percent of cells in that sample that have methylation there. And the way epigenetic clocks have been developed is that they apply supervised machine learning. So you have some outcome that you're trying to predict. Traditionally, this has been chronological age. And you use different machine learning algorithms, whether they're neural nets and deep learning or maybe more uh, shallow linear methods to try and predict that outcome, which again, tends to be uh, age or some aging correlate. So in thinking about epigenetic clocks, I like to also think of what are criteria for good aging biomarkers? So probably the most obvious one is that if you're actually measuring aging, you should have something that changes as a function of chronological age, and that's in a, a sample with no interventions. Um, but probably more important is that it should also moderate the associations between chronological age and risk. So as I, as I name off these criteria, they're getting, they'll get a little more difficult to actually uh, do. So, you know, developing a measure that correlates with age is actually pretty easy. Undergrads with very basic computer programming skills can do this. But to actually develop measures that cannot just track with age, but actually account for the age-related increases in morbidity and mortality is more difficult. And the important thing is that they should do this even in same-age individuals. So you have two people who are, let's say, 50 years old. They should be able to differentiate who's most at risk of developing a different disease. Um, another really important thing is they should have high technical reliability, and I'll go into this a little bit more. Uh, they should respond to interventions, and not just respond to interventions, but do so in a biologically meaningful way. And this is kind of where we are. Um, I think we've kind of been able to do these first four, and this is really what we need to be doing next, is making sure that the measures we develop are responsive to interventions, again, in a biologically meaningful way, which is really going to come down to our mechanistic understanding. So for us to say it's biologically meaningful, we have to have some understanding of the mechanisms involved in how those changes will actually propagate up and, and actually affect function. And then a few other things that I uh, think about, and I'm not going to talk about today, but I kind of wanted to put these questions out there, is how many dimensions of aging do we actually think a single biomarker should capture, and how universal should it be? So uh, the one interesting thing about epigenetic clocks is you can use the exact same clock regardless of what tissue type you have, and actually now Steve Horvath has even shown you can use them across different species. Um, but do you want a, a clock that's actually universal, or do you want something more specific? to whatever you're uh, looking at. So I'm gonna kind of go through some of these criteria and discuss where we are with them. Um, I'm not gonna show that epigenetic clocks track with chronological age because I think everyone kind of knows that you can get correlations over 0.9. Um, but the thing I'm gonna talk about first is just how they relate to function. Um, so this is actually new work um, by my student Ragolf, who's actually at ARDD. He has a poster there. I'm only gonna show a tiny bit about this, but if you're interested, go visit his poster and he has a lot more results he can show. So we've actually done work trying to use epigenetic clocks to capture aging in different systems from just blood samples. So can we capture aging in the brain, in kidney, in liver, in lung? from blood samples. And of course you can do this using clinical biomarkers, but our question was, if you have epigenetic data, you only have to do one assay. So this is something a bunch of cohorts can do. It's something you can easily employ in a clinical trial. You don't have to measure 200 different assays to actually be able to do this. Um, so, so far we actually think that we can do this. 
This is some results um, just showing previous epigenetic clocks and their association with different outcomes. We show our full systems age, which is when you put all of the different systems together. But we also show the specificity in terms of specific systems that actually relate to these outcomes. And I will say that actually the effect sizes for these are as good as any clinical measure we've seen. So, for instance, if you're looking at predicting mortality, we find that systems age does pretty well, but also just knowing heart age does really well. Uh, the light versus dark is after you account for things like smoking. Uh, same for comorbidities. We actually find our inflammation measured as well. Um, and you can kind of go through all of these different ones. Again, heart does well for myocardial infarction and CHD. Our brain measure is a very good predictor of cognitive functioning. Musculoskeletal is a good predictor of physical functioning, so on and so forth. So the other thing that I mentioned that's really important for epigenetic clocks or any biomarker of aging is technical reliability. So what I mean by that is if I take one sample and I measure it twice, will I get the same answer? Um, and what we found looking back at most of the epigenetic clocks that have been developed is actually they have very low technical reliability. So what's shown here is the difference between two replicates from the exact same blood sample. And this is kind of the difference. So you can see for some clocks, you get five, six, or even up to nine years difference between your two technical replicates. And this is just them plotted against each other. So, you know, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, this is the end of epigenetic clocks. You're not going to be able to use them in clinical trials. Um, but actually, we've developed a new, a new statistical method. I won't go into it called this PC clock method. You can look it up. Um, it was developed by Albert Higgins Chen while he was a postdoc in my lab, which actually can bring these down to only about a one year difference between your technical replicates. And why is this important? So one application is that it actually improves longitudinal tracking. So when you look at the original clocks, which are over here, you can see people jumping around a lot in their epigenetic age. And we don't know if that's actually biologically meaningful. So if they're actually truly changing epigenetic age. Um, but what we found is that when we apply this new method, you actually get much smoother changes. So we can actually track people uh, in a more meaningful way across time. This is also really important for clinical trials. So if you imagine you have some clinical trial, you expect it to produce one year or maybe a two year change in epigenetic age, you actually won't have power to detect that if you have a lot of noise in your data. So actually what we've done is we've gone through and actually estimated the sample size requirements for the original clocks as a function of what effect size you would expect versus the PC clocks. And you can see that this drastically reduces the number of people you would have to enroll in a clinical trial. This also helps um, if you want to do high put, throughput screens in vitro. So the other interesting thing about epigenetic clocks, they they can also be applied to in vitro data. So this is astrocytes um, that are serially passaged. You can see the original clocks jump around a lot. Um, but actually, when you look at these PC clocks, you see very um, clean changes in epigenetic age as a function of passaging. And again, uh, we estimated sample size requirements if you were to do uh, these high throughput screens in vitro to actually be able to detect an, a change in epigenetic age. Um, and then the final thing I'll talk about comes back to this idea of actually trying to understand mechanisms in epigenetic clocks. So what are epigenetic clocks capturing? I think this has been the biggest disappointment, I shall say, in terms of the epigenetic clock field. And one way that I actually, um, one thing that really made me think about this is when you look at epigenetic clocks, there's a lot of discordance. So what I mean by that is, you know, they're all theoretically developed to capture the same thing. So some aging phenotype using DNA methylation, but they actually don't agree. So, you know, one clock might show uh, a change in response to some intervention. Another clock might show uh, that it's highly associated with some outcome, but they actually don't agree and you get different answers for different clocks. So uh, to me, one of the cleanest examples of this is uh, in uh, reprogramming. So this is fibroblasts where you use OSKM to 
um, referral gram into IPSCs. And people have shown that epigenetic clocks uh, change as a function of this, but they don't all do so in the same way. So you have a lot of epigenetic clocks that behave as you would expect. So they get younger as a function of reprogramming. But you know, some epigenetic clocks that actually go the opposite way and look like they're getting, these samples are getting older as cells are de-differentiated and move to this IPSC state. So our hypothesis is that actually there are lots of unique dimensions of epigenetic aging. It's not a single phen phenomenon. And each of these dimensions probably has different causal explanations and also different functional consequences. Um, and so each epigenetic clock is a composite of these various dimensions, but they're going to weight them a little bit differently in their construction. So we actually think if you want to understand mechanism and function, we need to actually isolate the different dimensions and deconstruct the epigenetic clocks into their different parts. And we have a preprint on this. I don't have time to go into everything, but I'll just show one example again using that same reprogramming um, experiment where we break clocks down into these different modules. So each of these colors is a piece of the clock. If you added them all up, you get the full clock score. But what you can see is that there are certain modules. So these green and green yellow modules that are much more responsive to this reprogramming. We also find that there are certain modules that are actually underlying the mortality associations with epigenetic clocks or some that are more responsive uh, to serial passaging. So in thinking about this, if we actually want to understand whether there's biologically meaningful responses to interventions, we need to recognize that not all parts of epigenetic clocks functionally matter. And actually in our intervention testing or in looking at associations, we actually need to figure out which pieces of the clocks are responding and whether those are functionally the ones that we actually care about. So, you know, I like to think of this kind of the blind man and the elephant. You want to know what the different pieces are, how they work together, and if you're getting a change, which of these pieces is actually uh, responsible for that and what that functionally means. So this is kind of where we are now with epigenetic clocks um, and I think where we need to go with working on them in the future. And with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, people in my group, formerly uh, my group at Yale, as well as people um, now in my group at Altos, and happy to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Morgan. We have uh, time for a few questions. Um, let's see. I think everybody is uh, hung. Oh, there's one in the back there. Uh, now they're coming. Um, uh, thanks for the great talk. So maybe I missed it, but how correlative are the aging clocks when it comes from different tissues? Maybe you explained it, but I didn't get it properly. Yeah, so, so are you referring to when you measure epigenetic age specifically in different tissues? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, this hasn't been explored that much because, as you can imagine, we usually don't have multiple tissue samples from the same individual. Um, there are a few cases where we do, um, and it seems like actually there's not great... Uh, concordance between different tissues. There are some tissues that actually track together, but others that, that don't. So we've looked specifically at, at breast sam uh, samples from normal breast tissue and blood, and they actually don't seem to correlate at all. Thank you very much for your talk. Is it possible to calculate the positive predictive value of uh, aging clock in addition to the other risk factors? Because this is yeah. what we use clinically as to evaluate the value of a particular test. Yeah, so I don't have the actual statistics on me, but you know, if you take normal risk factors that people think about and you put them all in a model with epigenetic clocks, epigenetic clocks still explain additional um, variance in terms of risk for all-cause mortality or specific disease outcomes. All right. Thank you so much, Morgan, and thank you for joining despite your uh, running a fever and being cold, having a cold. Thank you so much.